Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to Politics and Prose Live. Uh, I'm Bernard Fajardo, a bookseller here at Politics and Prose on behalf of the owners and of the staff. Uh, I welcome all of you to this uh, evening's event. So at any time during the event, you can click on the link in the chat to purchase copies of the next book on Politics and Prose's website. Uh, your purchases will come to the store at a difficult time for small businesses across the country. And in addition to growing your own library, a book sale from Politics and Prose means that we at the store are able to keep bringing your, uh, you content like this, which we are so proud of. You can ask the author a question by submitting it to the Q&A box, the, bottom, the button for which you can be found near the bo uh, bottom of your screen. Be sure to submit it in the Q&A and not in the chat to make sure that the author and the moderator sees it. So I waste no more time getting to the main event. Uh, I am honored to introduce Deborah Levy to all of you today. Deborah is a fellow of the Royal Society of Liter Literature and is the author of seven novels and two memoirs, including Swimming Home and Hot Milk, both of which were shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize. Uh, this evening, she will be talking about her new book, uh, Real Estate, the third and final installment of her living autobiography series. Uh, Alexandra Schwartz, writing for The New Yorker, writes in her review that Levy, whose prose is at once declarative and concrete and touched with an almost oracular pithiness, has a gift for imbuing ordinary observations with the magic of metaphor, the ordinary stuff of modern life, made radiant by Levy's clarifying prose. Uh, Deborah will be in conversation with Andrew Durbin, the author of MacArthur Park and Skyland, both from Nightboat Books. His fiction, criticism, poet, and poetry have appeared in The Believer, Bomb, Boston Review, The New York Review of Books, The Paris Review, Triple Canopy, and elsewhere. Uh, everyone, let us all welcome Deborah Levy and Andrew Durbin. Hi, Deborah. Hi, Andrew. Do you want to maybe, maybe before you read from some of the book, do you want to say where you're coming to us from? <laughs> okay. So I'm sorry about this kind of film noir lighting, but I'm in a, a old stone house on a Greek island. It's one in the morning um, and uh, the stars are bright. The moon is full, but there's not much light in uh, this house. And um, I'm really grateful to Politics and Prose um, for hosting this event, um, to my publishers, Bloomsbury, for uh, all the work they've done on this uh, beautiful edition of Real Estate, and to you, Andrew. Thanks, yeah, and, and just to shout out the, the bookstore, anyone who has not been to it in Washington, D.C., it's a really wonderful bookstore, and I hope you do pick up Deborah's books there. I have the British edition, which is also an extremely beautiful book, and I guess, Deborah, it would be wonderful for you to read a few passages and then maybe sketch out the book, because I know it's just come out in the U.S., so probably many people haven't had a chance to actually sink their teeth into this. Okay, so I'm going to read... Uh, from the beginning of the book. Um, I start with um, Georgia O'Keeffe and um, I write a little bit about the house that she found in New Mexico, a place to <clears throat> live and work at her own pace is what she wanted. And it's what the narrator of real estate who is a little like myself but not quite myself. I sometimes uh, refer to her as a narrator just to give some distance uh, to things, but we can, um, <clears throat> but anyway, I was also searching for a house in which I could live and work and make a world at my own pace. But even in my imagination, this hope, home was blurred, undefined, not real, or not realistic, or lacked realism. I yearned for a grand old house. I'd, I had now added an oval fireplace to its architecture, 
and a pomegranate tree in the garden. It had fountains and wells, remarkable circular stairways, mosaic floors, traces of the rituals of all who had lived there before me. That is to say, the house was lively. It had enjoyed a life. It was a loving house. The wish for this home was intense, yet I could not place it geographically, nor did I know how to achieve such a spectacular house with my precarious income. All the same, I added it to my imagined property portfolio, along with a few other imagined minor properties. The house with the pomegranate tree was my major acquisition. In this sense, I had found some unreal estate. The odd thing was that every time I tried to see myself inside this grand old house, I felt sad. It was as if the search for home was the point. And now that I had acquired it and the chase was over, there were no more branches to put in the fire. So uh, that's how I kick off. And, and I guess that um, uh, real estate is um, about a very real physical longing for a house. And, um, and then there's a question, is a house the same thing as home? Um, it is also about <clears throat> leaving a homeland, and in my case, leaving um, South Africa when I was nine years old. Um, and uh, I grew up in England um, from that age. And then I asked another question, well, um, are women the real estate owned by patriarchy? And if that is the case, then are we all sitting tenants on the land? And um, I guess then that every book we write is sort of drilling on that land. And then it's an existential book as well. Um, uh, so I, I think that's enough, Andrew. Um, what, what else is there to say? Well, maybe, I mean, I, I guess maybe we could maybe we could begin where you sort of began, which is this idea of the narrator being you and, and not you. Because this this narrator, I mean, the voice of this book is really, for me, it, it, it's such an amazing voice. I mean, I think Alexandra Schwartzman, when she calls it oracular, is it's one way to put it. But I think what it responds to the world, but it also writes through the world. And you think so much about quotation and the placement of... I guess I'm wondering where this voice began for you. Like, like when, when it's, it's the ending of a trilogy and, I, and, I'm, and, I'm, and the, the first trilogy, the first part of the trilogy responds to a quotation by Orwell. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit about how that voice developed. Sure. Um, yeah, so um, I guess the hardest thing about um, writing a trilogy, like this is to find a, a voice that's intimate and formal. Mm -hmm. um, that that was very important to me, kind of not too distant, but 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 not um, really too close either. So um, the trilogy started when um, Jack Testard, who used to edit, he was a co-editor and co-founder of. The White Review, um, an art and literature magazine in, in, in Britain, an incredible publication. Um, uh, Jacques is now a, a publish the publisher of Fitzcarraldo. Um, um, and um, he had wound up at a brilliant small press called Notting Hill Editions in Britain, the home of the essay. I had just been shortlisted for the Booker Prize for my novel, Swimming Home. And Jack said, well, Deborah, do you want to write an essay? You can have 25,000 words or 47,000 words. So I reckon I'd take the 25,000 words. And um, my, my idea then was to give George Orwell's four uh, headings um, for what motivated him 
to write a spin from a female writer's point of view. So his four headings were, um, this is not quite the right order, but political purpose, historical impulse, uh, sheer egoism, um, and what was the fourth one? I'll come, I'll come back to that. Have you got it there? Aesthetic enthusiasm. Aesthetic enthusiasm. enthusiasm. That's quite a strange, uh, quite a strange formation that. And, and to my surprise, under political purpose, I found myself writing the lines, uh, something like uh, that spring when life was very hard and I could not see where there was to get to, and I was at war with my lot, I found myself crying on escalators and train stations. And this was very strange to me, to, to be writing this, these sentences under something called political purpose, and that was the beginning. It interested me. I had never written, um, I don't think, an essay in the first person although there are very good examples in literature of this. And of course, Virginia Woolf is, is one of them. Um, in fact, I think that uh, I had mostly written in the third person and that kind of elegance of, a, of, of the sort of long shot or an aerial shot was much more suited at the time to the way I wrote. So I began to develop this voice in the first person and um, and I found that I could in more essayistic writing, um, in Allen Ginsberg's words, notice what I notice. Mm. I always thought that was such a great um, note to writers because what we notice um, is, is the point of writing. And what we do with what we notice is, is technique or skill. It's, it's the job of the writer. Um, and so I began to develop um, that th the voice of the three trilogies in Things I Don't Want to Know. And Things I Don't Want to Know, um, a, a strange title, um, are really the things we know anyway, but repress. So, um, so th that was kind of interesting to me too. And the digressions of the essayistic form. So, so for example, in real estate, you can, uh, um, you know, you can go from uh, being interested in Marx's line, um, that's Karl Marx's line, everything solid melts into air and interested in the structure of the house I was living in at the time, which is if I could, if I put my finger through the wall, um, a sort of torrent of sand um, began to pour out of it. And it seemed absolutely that everything that is solid was going to melt into thin air. And that feels mm -hmm. very much like the world at the moment anyway. Mm -hmm. There's that there's the tension in the book, though, between this like imagined home and the very real people and your the narrator's life, like your family, your daughters, the, the friends that you've sort of used to, to constitute this. And there becomes this question throughout the, the books, I think, about where one can write and where one can be at home. There's, of course, most people who have read the earlier ones. There's this question of the the shed which is a, a conceit and in in the earlier ones and then and this one it becomes that sort of enlarges to a much bigger place and I guess one thing that I've been thinking about in your work a lot is is the idea of traveling and where you can kind of create a kind of mobile home too and I'm wondering about the role of travel in your work and the way the sort of the chance encounter uh, takes place because that that seems to be where a lot of there's a kind of kickoff in a lot of the way that you you start to think about the world in, in your particular writing. I don't I don't know if, if that question quite makes sense. I want to mm -hmm. think about the basically the kind of actual trajectory of this of real estate because you you you're in India, you're in South Africa a bit. You're sort of going back in time forward. There's a there's an interesting way that time is working too. 
Yeah, so real estate is structured around uh, various cities and countries um, and continents, but um, I think all writing, in a sense, is travel writing. You could you could say the same of I'm pushing it a bit of of James and and Forster, you know. Um, so travel is very important to me, but it's important to the book because the, the book is, is not just about interiors. It's about um, the interesting thing about memoirish writing, um, in my view, is that um, the art of it is to write about other people because um, so, so, how to how to crash into other subjectivities and get out of the claustrophobic first person or or, or you know um it was was very preoccupying for me and then also i mean sort of influences like frank o'hara we were talking we were talking about him earlier um the, uh, particularly in his poem, In Memory of My Feelings, which I've got here, Andrew, just because um, I love the first line so much, and I was reading it again today. Um, my quietness has a man in it. He is transparent, and he carries me quietly like a gondola through the streets. Well, that's kind of travel writing, but my interest is in, um, is in the apparent freedom of digression of everyday speech and all of that and this perfect tight technique and form so that um so so, so his line breaks are so perfect um following his thought thoughts and breath and that was something that i wanted to do in prose mm -hmm. um and, and particularly in these three books. So my quietness as a man in it is as influential really to me as all of Wolf's work, Elizabeth Hardwick as well, Sleepless Nights and, and her essay, Seduction and Betrayal, was something that I, that, that I was reading and admiring at the time too. Mm -hmm. I mean, these books are sort of have kind of invented a genre of like the living autobiography. And I'm wondering, I mean, I want to sort of riff on this, this idea of influence, but I guess I, I would love to hear more about that. But I'm also wondering if you've sort of retroactively scooped people into this genre, like Sleepless Nights and, and Frank O'Hara, if this has now become a genre by which you have begun to actually not just write, but also to read the world. Yeah, well, all writers read the world. Um, I don't know. Uh, I think it's just too early to say, mm -hmm. you know, um, I think that, I think that, um, I think it's really surprising um, as, as, as one writes to rediscover one's influences. Um, and I, I wouldn't claim to be inventing a genre, genre uh, I called them living autobiographies. I just made up that term because I wanted to get away from that idea of nostalgia and chronology, um, that uh, an autobiography was somehow um, looking back over your shoulder um, at the past. In fact, when I read autobiographies, I sometimes <clears throat> don't actually read them uh, chronologically. I tend to skip childhood um, I then get into uh, when the protagonist has sort of leaves home and has a few ideas of their own. And at the end, I return to childhood. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that was interesting to me. And I thought, yes, I, I can, I could perhaps write these as I read, um, as, as I read those memoirs, why do I do that? And it's because obviously we carry our childhoods around with us through life. Um, we don't need a kind of separate section for it um, mm. kind of thing. 
Though it's the, the books are so, kind of interested in this idea of a separate section too. Like it sort of plays with this idea of other other spaces outside of fiction and nonfiction, outside of the home, the shed, of course, the, the various places you go. Um, I, I guess I'm I'm it, the, the books are so much about sort of as I said, reading, reading, and sort of writing into and against the world. And I'm wondering how. When when reading your your sort of body of work, I think that these have such a special place in them, and I'm wondering if they changed how you write your fiction. I mean, you mentioned actually this was maybe one of the first times you really moved into the first person, and then I, I um, the I guess the novel you wrote during this period is the man who saw everything, and I'm curious how that was mm. changed by the process of writing these. Mm. Well, I should say that I was changed. Uh, when I finished every single one of these um, living autobiographies, I felt changed in some way. Um, writing The Man Who Saw Everything um, was, very, was interesting because that, that was also in the first person. Mm -hmm. um, it was, I, I was going to collapse time completely um, and somehow I had to work out how to uh not lose uh the, the narrative which was important to me um how could i kind of rearrange how how could i rearrange the way the story is told and believe it myself so um that was about setting reality levels um for for saw adler the main, mm -hmm. the main protagonist. Um, I guess that um, writing fiction it just has a different momentum for me, a, a different purpose, a different kind of energy, and different drive. But what they share is um, is that I kind of believe that. I, I, what they share actually is a sort of light surface. I like to create a deceptively light surface, and then um, and then a uh, a sort of underpool, shockingly deep underpool. I mean that in a in, as a swimmer actually. Mm -hmm. um, you know um, that that's that's really my my interest. So um, the other thing that that is important to me, I guess, is that my books uh, are sort of cleverer than I am, because it would be terrible if it was the other way around. It'd be terrible if the writer is sort of cleverer than her books, right? So mm -hmm. so so um, uh, so that's another way of saying that the unconscious of the book is sort of cleverer than I am really. And when I feel that is somehow being made manifest in that, that uh, intention is being made manifest in anything I write, I can smell the smoke and I know that, I know that the, the book is working. So, um, <laughs> I just, yeah. I mean, are, are there moments in real estate where I guess you, you <clears throat> either when you were writing or when you've looked back on it, where you felt like this was a moment where the book outsmarted me or was cleverer than me or sort of did something that, something interesting that I didn't quite anticipate? Are there those moments that you now return to, you think sort of the mystery of, of writing sort of takes place, I guess, in a sense? Yeah, so um, I think I'm not going to... Uh, help that great question you've asked too mm -hmm. much because if I'm if I it's not really for me to identify those places right. it's right. for the reader to do so um, but obviously um, you know that's the point of writing it, it happened that that's um, it's, it's also great when something obscure to you and um, incoherent to oneself suddenly becomes coherent and um, uh, you know that's that's um, that's the opposite 
of of the mystery of writing kind of thing. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was important conceptually to me, uh, real estate, um, that uh, what, as an object, what the reader is holding in the hand is my real estate, my property, because um, I sort of push that idea in the book is that really is, is the sort of ownership of, of one's mind, of, of one's authorship. So, um, you know, there's a kind of expanded idea of, of property in the book too. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think about, because one thing that the whole trilogy deals with is the both the politics of language and the politics of memory, which is very, that's in the beginning with Orwell and it sort of continues on throughout that. And I guess I'm, you, you, so much of the books deal with the sort of like political legacy of your family and that the kind of migration from South Africa to the US, I mean, sorry, to the UK and the, the, sort of political engagements of your father and then your sort of own sort of thinking about that. And I guess I wanna know how, I think you can approach that in a lot of different ways to have that kind of particular family background. And I'm curious how you thought about putting your parents into these books, how you, how you put the people, if like the narrator isn't quite you, are the, like the, the parents, your parent, you know, like how does that, how much, how much change happened within that or, or are they, Yeah. what is sort of the act of writing about them do? <clears throat> so I'm writing about very select um, parts of experience. Um, and when, um, so I, I write quite, quite a lot about my mother. I write about um, the ways in which um, I, I ask myself, well, did I diminish her? Did I mock her for having no dreams? Did I, um, what, 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 was, what, what was being transmitted to me by her and uh, to her by me? Um, I'm just seeing if I could, if I can find um, that passage. Uh, here, uh, but your your question is, you know, um, why are they there? They there they there to kind of contribute in real estate to 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 add more dimensions to the idea of home. So um, uh, that's that's really really why they're there. So here we go. My childhood in South Africa had mostly been preoccupied with trying to avoid pain. That was one of the things I did not want to know. And I'm talking, I, I'm talking about a quote from um, R.D. Lang here, The Divided Self. There is a great deal of pain in life, and perhaps the only pain that can be avoided is the pain that comes from trying to avoid pain. So that's Lang uh, writing in 1960. And so I'll run with that idea and, um, and, and embrace some of um, the ways in which my parents sort of contribute to that idea. So I'm not really writing about their lives. I'm writing about attachment and detachment, attachment to them and detachment. And, um, and I'm writing politically about my mother and about uh, I'm questioning notions of the maternal. Um, um, and I am trying to accept in the cost of living, the loss of my mother. Um, you know, so, and the question in real estate is, well, when I cry about my mother, what am I crying about? When I write about my father, what am I writing about? Um, 
and, and sort of unfold things that way. I'm not really writing, up, re really writing about them. I'm writing about uh, myself and I'm writing about society. And somehow this elastic eye has to um, uh, embrace that. And it mostly does. Mm -hmm. There's also this moment at the end of real estate, I was just just flipping to it, where you're, you're encountering a rented house on Idra, um, mm -hmm. and perhaps the one you're in right now, who knows? Um, and you write that this rented house was a taunt, a provocation, it made me feel more alive. If I was full of desire for its ambience and grace, the fact that I did not have the means to buy it only accelerated my desire. I love this, this taunt. You're kind of you're kind of always taunted in your books by these different spaces too. You there's this um, the the shed is similar. You know, it's this place where you kind of can be housed and be creative. But then there's all these other intervening questions and forces and relationships, and that even becomes the sort of toward the end of almost the last line where you say, "I suppose that what I most value are real human relations and imagination. It is possible we cannot have one without the other." So there's these intersect, there's these, the taunts are kind of what's really necessary, I guess. And I'm wondering if you thought about, I mean, it begins with Orwell. Orwell is sort of a provocation you set up for yourself. And I, I wonder about that, I guess. I wonder about, about where those, those, how you think about those provocations. Yeah, well, I mean, um, what kind of writing doesn't provoke? Um, uh, the world is very provocative. Um, show me someone who hasn't been provoked by the world, um, you know, so um, it's, it's going to turn up in the writing. And the idea, the, the idea I, that you, you rightly exploring there is um, the fact that it was, it's the desire for a home is perhaps really just desire itself. Um, it, it just ex it, um, so I'm exploring how desire keeps us alive mm -hmm. uh, and, and and curious and any kind of writing that doesn't that kind of flattens desire or sanitizes it. Um, I don't just mean sexual desire, um, as you know. You know, it's um, a, a sort of a, a sort of wanting. Um, is a kind of depressed book. So, um, so desire is a theme in all my books, particularly in uh, The Man Who Saw Everything, um, but really in Swimming Home too, it leads the way. Um, someone stopped me here the other day and um, a reader of my books, and um, so, so she said some nice things about my books. And then she said, are you a Freudian? And I thought, well, um, yeah, well, I do read quite a lot of Freud, and um, but I didn't think I wanted to be nailed in that way. So um, I said, um, perhaps in the way that you, you're describing, you know, the provocations that uh, interest and amuse me, I said, no, I'm a Lacanian. And she said, oh, I'm a Lacanian analyst. And I thought, oh no, I've really dug a very big hole for myself because I understand about three lines per page of, of, of Lacan. Um, and then she said a very interesting thing. She said, well, um, when the lips of the unconscious speak, so this is, this, is, this is her speaking, I end the session. There doesn't have to be a 50 minute session. And I thought, yeah, well, that's sort of how I end a chapter. So we had a very, we, we had quite an interesting conversation about that. And um, I was wondering if that was true. Do I really end um, a chapter with something that I don't completely understand? Because you sort of, um, not supposed to do that. And I think I do. And, um, and then kind of unfold it in the next, in the next chapter. Mm. So something I didn't know I knew. And, and that's true for all the books, not just the memoirs. Is that how you think, think about like, 
Like you have this moment where you actually write about writing the man who saw everything. Yeah. And you say, you're thinking about the, the, the idea of the Jaguar and all of that, that stuff. And you, you say, um, why not try and grasp the weird ways in which the human mind can go anywhere? Which I think is kind of, to me, a sort of thesis for your work where it's like sort of the weird, the weird places, you know, the, the sort of holes in the wall where the stuff comes out and you kind of don't know where to, why, I guess, why stop the auto, like I, 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 anyone who's read these loves them and would love them to go for the rest of forever. And I'm, I wonder why stop with real estate. It seems like there's still more, more terror, there's still more houses to build. <laughs> no, I think I've told the builders to go home. Um, uh, I feel this is probably the end of the trilogy. Never say never. I mean, you know, maybe in five years time, I'm going to shock myself and um, come up with a fourth. But I didn't want to kind of have my own life as a sort of performance, something um, that would be that would be very um, sort of distressing. So I felt that this had landed the trilogy. That that real estate was the right title for it. Um, I love those words, real estate, and I play around with them in the book. And and you know the the narrator has quite a lot of unreal estate in her imagined property portfolio. Um, I liked it that most books called real estate would probably end with the acquiring of a property. And, um, and I felt that it was um, kind of interesting not to, um, and to suggest that, um, and just to, I'm trying not to actually talk about the end of the book. So, so I'm being a little, little obscure here, but I will say something about the end of the book. I was very struck in um, A Room of One's Own when Virginia Woolf writes about uh, walking on the grass at an Oxbridge college. And she's thinking about something and a porter, a beagle stops her. And he tells her to get off the grass because only scholars and um, are, are allowed on the grass. And um, she forgets about what she's thinking. Mm. Um, and what she can't really say is that what she was thinking was valuable. And that um, she was furious about not being able to walk on the grass, so to speak, in its biggest, bigger sense. And so the last line in the book about grass um, really refers to, to that moment. I think, um, so I'll ask one more question and then I, I encourage everyone to drop your own questions in the chat and I will put them to Deborah. Um, <clears throat> but I think it's always nice to ask sort of, I mean, first of all, there's many things we didn't cover. I would love to know about the women in your work in these particular books and feminism, which is obviously a kind of something you're thinking about. And also we kind of avoided the term auto fiction, but I think maybe that would have been interesting to contend with. Um, but I guess uh, I'm curious what you're, what, what's next? Like what, if, if not another um, if not a fourth living autobiography, then what 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 can we expect from you? I'm assuming another novel. Okay, so I'm writing a novel, um, and it's about the doppelganger, about the double. And um, I'm uh, really interested in the way that David Lynch uses the double, uh, particularly in Mulholland Drive, obviously movies like uh, The Double Life of Veronique, um, I'm reading all the Gothic literature. I'm really uh, not interested in the idea of the double as a split self. So to put it very, you know, um, boldly, uh, Jekyll and Hyde, a good self and a bad self. I'm much more interested in a good and bad self coexisting. Um, 
without having to construct a double. So that's what I'm chasing at the moment. Um, mm. And um, I'm, I'm loving writing it. Um, um, yeah. And it's great to be back um, writing fiction. Great. I'm excited. I think all of us are. So we have a few questions here. Um, so just quickly looking through them. Sorry about this. Um, maybe maybe a kind of simple first one. Who and what are you reading right now? Ah, okay. So I'm just finished a really brilliant book by a Canadian poet, I think, called Lisa Robertson. It's called The Baudelaire Fract Fractal. Um, and it is about a, uh, it's a novel, and it's about a, a woman called Hazel Brown who wakes up one morning to discover that she has written the entire works of Baudelaire. Have you read it, Andrew? No, oh, uh, yeah, yeah the, the, sorry, the Baudelaire fractal. Yeah, yeah, she's brilliant. Yeah, so, um, so this is the first book by Lisa Robertson I've ever read. I'm completely blown away. It's really about identity and authorship. Um, it's a, it's uh, uh, Lisa, Lisa Robertson's prose is, is crystalline and mysterious at the same time. Um, and I recommend it to everyone. The weather is also, or, yeah, what, she has, a, she has a, a number of just very beautiful books. Lisa Robertson's Magenta Soul With is also really wonderful. Um, uh, so uh, Marie Kuhlman asks, uh, can you talk about the idea of freeing yourself from domestic concerns per Simone de Beauvoir? Yet the joy you express in the book of cooking for others and setting up the, and entertain, basically entertaining in your empty nest in Paris. Does that make sense as a... Um, okay. okay. Um, so, um, so we're talking about the cost of living here. I used I use Simone de Beauvoir. Um, I, I there's a there's a sort of riff in the cost of living, which is although Simone de Beauvoir was uh, sort of my muse, I was I would certainly never have been hers. That we both bought a ticket though for something obscure called Freedom, but. Uh, we got off at different platforms on the train. I got off uh, um, at marriage and children, um, and I lived in the Republic of Writing and Children and um, all of that. So, um, a Beauvoir in real estate, um, I think I'm looking at her take on or, or fury or discomfort um, with aging, which was really interesting to me. Mm. So many questions about um, analysis. So um, I'll put a few to you. Um, sorry, I'm, I, I, I'm, if I seem slightly distracted, I'm like going through these May. Uh, I, um, Lacan said of the unconscious, uh, we do not speak, we are spoken. Could you say more about this in relation to the creative process? Seems relevant with what you mentioned earlier. Yeah, well, that's a great question. Um, and um, I, I totally agree with that. Um, and uh, that's really the point of writing, actually. If we can, if we can get to that point, um, we, it, it's bound to be interesting. Hmm. Um, this is a slightly longer one. Uh, you mentioned Freud in the living autobiographies. Could you please speak to the ways he influenced the writing of them? I thought perhaps it was the way you pay attention to the unconscious associations with objects and the kind of totemic significance they attain, the bird clock, the turmeric sheets, the Afghan horses, and how they also tell a story but maybe the Freudian influence is elsewhere. Um, and then this person says, thank you for the beautiful books. And Well, thank you for your astute observation. And um, yeah, so I write a lot about objects um, and they have to hold a lot of 
the narrative and quite a lot of the emotion that um, that I that I might be exploring at that moment. And objects also hold time. Um, I'm interested in what we project into, pour into objects. Um, as I know that the questioner will be too. Um, I'm interested in how objects speak to us and for us. Um, and then really, maybe I should sort of depart a little bit from the psychoanalytic into the into visual art, because I taught for 10 years at the Royal College of Art. And, um, you know, uh, just, just the juxtaposition of objects, the making of objects, the materials um, used, um, will always be a major obsession with me. Um, so um, at the moment, I'm really interested in the way a ladder on a boat uh, that, un that underneath it is a, a place sort of like floats, rubber floats or, or, or buoys. I don't really know what they're called. So I'm interested in something soft um, juxtaposed against something hard and something vertical. Um, uh, sort of the, the, the reciprocity, the give and take of these two materials. Um, in the same way, perhaps, as Louise Bourgeois, I think I read that she looked out once at the New York skyline and she saw the skyscrapers and she thought, well, they don't really, they need to be close together. They don't really lean into each other and touch. And she was beginning to think about, think about them, about human relations in relation to, to the skyline. So again, um, you know, we just notice, writers just notice strange things. And then you have to have to kind of haul your arguments home. You have to make manifest whatever it is that is speaking to you um, via object, via these objects. That's a life's work. Um, so, um, someone asks, regarding the women and feminist themes, do you find yourself revisiting um, older works, especially plays um, and other female archetypes? Do I find myself revisiting what works? I, older works. Um, I, guess, I guess, regarding the women and feminist themes, do you find yourself revisiting older works, especially plays, for example, PAX, P-A-X, and its okay. female archetypes. Oh, thank you for the question. I don't really revisit the plays, um, but they were my earliest work. I had a theatre training and I wrote plays before I wrote short stories and, um, and prose. So um, the, the thing about a theatre training was that you really do have to make... Um, uh, to, to put words into a performer's mouth is a very powerful thing. It was a very powerful thing as a young woman, um, eight, sort of 18, 19, to do. Um, and then when, I, when plays started to be commissioned from me, um, there was nothing more humiliating than being in a rehearsal room and giving up a, a skilled performer dud lines that just die in their mouth, you know? So I learned very quickly to edit on the spot. Um, and I think that uh, to, to kind of edit brutally. Um, so I think that was something that I am, that I learned to do too in prose. Um, but revisiting those plays, no. Not, not really. I will one day. I'd like to revisit a play I wrote called Honey Baby, 13 Studies in Exile. Um, you mentioned that you, and, and by the way, everyone, um, we have time for a few more questions, so please do get those in. Um, someone says, you mentioned that you end your chapters in a way similar to how the Lacanian psychoanalyst ends her sessions. 
Could you talk a bit about how you end your books? Oh my goodness. Um, well, <clears throat> I guess the answer is, um, you know, you, you end the book, you, you've kind of said everything you, you hope to say um, in the best possible way. Um, all writers really don't believe that they've managed to do that. But you want to reach somewhere near that, be somewhere near that place. So I think I want to end the books in a way that um, doesn't resolve anything, um, nor do I want to end on a point of confusion or mystery, but maybe um, to sort of continue, maybe it's a, the, the struggle is to, to have an ending that's also a continuing, that, that, that has a sort of uh, resonance after the last sentence. So if you look at the last sentence of Hot Milk, I, I'm not going to quote it here, but um, that would be an example of um, my attempt to do that. Um, I don't really, um, I don't want to get too stuck into this Lacanian thing. Um, I think that the unconscious is always speaking in the book. Um, that's not the same thing as streams of consciousness and all of that. Um, but if, if, if the language is working properly, that, that will happen. Um, a question that I think might have a typo in it, but I'll read it as it says. It says, are you hunted by images, but I assume haunted by images, though I'm intrigued actually by both op options there. <laughs> haunted by images. I am haunted by images. <clears throat> um, so I write very visually and I usually have, um, I, I usually can't start a, a book without um, a visual image in mind. Um, or even some architecture in mind. And it doesn't ha have to be um, something extraordinary. It can be something very um, uh, sort, of, sort of like with swimming home. I was thinking about swimming pools, literally swimming pools. Like what are they? And a swimming pool is a hole in the ground. So in this way, it kind of resembles a grave. Um, but a, a kind of watery grave. And then I began to sort of design a swimming pool in my mind that wasn't the clear blue swimming pool of tourist holiday brochures, um, but that was situated under uh, two trees. So this is before I've even written the first sentence of Swimming Home. I can see this image so clearly, two pine trees, and the cones keep falling into the water, and insects, bees, and flies are struggling and dying in the water. So, Swimming Home doesn't start like that at all. It starts on a, a road, a conversation between a man and a woman. Um, uh, but, I could not have written that page without that image in mind. Um, I thought a lot about Dorothy Tanning's Eine Kleine Night music, Nacht music, uh, for the trilogy. Um, I remember that she wrote something like, I think she was born in Illinois, and she wrote something like, the only thing that happened at home was the wallpaper. That really, that really stuck in my mind, and that image of the sunflowers climbing the stairs and the electrified hair is something very strong inside me when I was writing um, the living autobiographies. Thank you for that question. Can, can we build on that a little bit about the, the language of cinema and the role, it, the influence it has on your, your work in general? Because I mean, so for UK audiences, you'll see that each cover has a Godard still on here. And I think 
cinema is something you you think about it your your films have a kind of earlier you even mentioned sort of like writing in third person having a kind of different wide angle shot and i'm wondering if there are any particular filmmakers that have influenced you as a writer as much as say like a no, like a novelist or a, or an essayist or a poet if they're they're people you think about what they do as as generative for you oh yeah definitely i mean where to start agnes varda um fellini um, Godard, so the images on the British books are, are all from My Life to Live, 1962, with Anna Karenna. Um, Lynch, certainly. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in the way Lynch unfolds a narrative and in, or interconnecting narratives. Um, and then that, um, you know, yeah, this isn't literary language, but you have to kind of light a novel. <laughs> you know, you have to light and costume it. Um, I'm interested in Goddard's jump cuts and voiceovers. They were very influential. Mm -hmm. So maybe one last question from, from, the, from it. Um, I love that a, f a book can have an unconscious. Do you think that every book has one or is it more about the depth of thought of a writer, i.e. the writer's psyche and past that is lodged in the book? Yeah, both, absolutely both. So I recently reread uh, Bonjour Tristesse, which is, um, is it Franz Françoise Sagan? And uh, what interested me there, she wrote it when she was 18. And um, it's really um, the unconscious of that book, it seems to me, is that the author wanted to kill off her father's girlfriends so that he would exclusively love her. Um, it's a very beautiful book and atmospheric and, 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 and often sad book in its deceptively light way. So, um, Yes, there's, a, there's an unconscious to every book um, and, to, and to everything. There are two final questions, which I think actually might be easy to answer because there's one ask, uh, asking about who was the person who talked about the sunflowers on the wallpaper that was artist Dorothea Tanning. And the other asked the title of the autobiographies, which is things I don't yet, or things I don't want to know, the cost of living, and real estate. And I think that's all of the, the questions. Um, and here it is in the American edition. Um, Angie, thank you so much. And thank you for those great questions. Well, thanks for staying up, Deborah. I know it's quite late in, in Greece right now. It's two in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah. Uh, Thank you, uh, Deborah, and thank you, Andrew, for that wonderful uh, conversation about um, Deborah Levy's uh, new book, new memoir coming out called uh, Real Estate. Uh, so please, uh, and again, thank, thank you to the audience for attending this wonderful book talk. Uh, your patronage is what enables us to bring programming like this. And we cannot continue to host these types of events without the book sales to support them. So please uh, support uh, Deborah Levy and Politics and Prose by buying real estate using the link in the chat. So once again, thank you to everyone. Thank you to Andrew. Thank you to Deborah. Uh, stay well, well read, and uh, we'll see you next time.